Um, so excellent. Uh, I am Rohan from EOS Authority. I am joined today by Luke Riley, a postdoctoral research associate at King's College London. Uh, as the community knows, EOS Authority has been working with voting and voting analysis since the launch of the mainnet. We have um, several reports analyzing voting behavior, voting patterns, and so on. Um, Luke is also based in London, and um, Luke and I have been discussing uh, his research project since October last year, uh, a little over eight months now. Uh, today, Luke has a presentation on analyzing and improving the delegated proof of stake consensus protocol. Uh, he has a few slides to go over, and let me hand it over to Luke. Okay, great. Hello, everyone out there. Um, I will try and share my screen. Um, is that on, Rowan? Yes, yes, it is. Good. So let's go to full presentation. Uh, yes, so as mentioned in the introduction, um, we've been working on this idea for for about eight months. In King's College London, we have a wider group of academics who are looking at blockchain and voting uh, or distributed ledger technology and voting, it, mostly at the application level. So this is the first spin-off project looking more deeper at the consensus protocol and what better consensus protocol to look at in terms of voting than delegated proof of stake. Um, so this is my usual introduction slide. So why are we looking at a consensus protocol such as this? Uh, hopefully most people watching the video will understand that proof of work, it, you know, it has a very high energy consumption and a low number of transactions per second. And for the high energy consumption property, this mostly happens because, because they want, well, the protocol has been developed so that anyone can produce a block at any time. Uh, and then this is the trade-off. So an alternative is to elect um, a committee, a committee of block producers who for a certain time period, they will be the only ones who will be producing um blocks and there's many different types of proposed methods to elect this committee probably the most the one that's most easiest to understand uh for a general user is to elect this committee through through ju just a basic election and not rely on any mathematical um protocols such as other proposals and this leads us to talk to delegate proof of stake because of of course we have in EOS and other ones like that um, we have a committee that's a certain size so 21 block producers for EOS and then uh, every coin holder can select um, it's up to 30 as far as I'm aware still in EOS up to up to 30 candidates that they would like to represent them in the committee and then the tally up the results and from the tallies there'll be a final committee for the next period and then this will constant be, constantly be re-evaluated every so often. So in academia we refer to this voting method where you can select um, block producers you like basic, and not select ones you don't like. We call this approval uh, based voting. So, but we know from the academic literature that there is some flaws uh, of what we are describing as standard approval based voting. So standard approval based voting, just to clarify, everyone has selected uh, the block producers they like. We've put them into a tally and the committee that has been elected or selected is the, is the, to, is the, block producer candidates with the, the highest uh, tallies. So in EOS, it would be the 21 block producer candidates with the highest number of votes. That's standard approval voting. And the two flaws is because this tallying mechanism is quite simple, it's easy for every candidate to understand 
if they can strategically manipulate the results of the election by changing their specific vote. And the, the second one is slightly more complicated, and it's about um, how well does the elected committee represent the voters, the coin holders in this case. And we've got, I've got two examples to run through so you can understand exactly what I mean by this. Uh, but I also have an extra slide for academic references. So if you want to follow up and read more detail about these two standard flaws, uh, then these two pieces of literature are good places to start. And this is work uh, by some of worldwide leading experts in voting theory from top universities all around the world. So this is an active, uh, standard approval voting is a very active research area in academia. So we need to start to try and get these ideas across um, into the blockchain world. So the, the first flaw I wanted to describe is strategic voting. Uh, and I've put together an example here. The, uh, we have a committee here of size two, to make it simple. Um, these are the two people with a question mark on their head. We don't know who the candidate, um, the elected uh, committee is going to be yet. So we need to look at the tally. We can see we've got four candidates and candidate uh, one and two have the most votes. So that's fairly simple. We'll put them in the committee for the next um, the next cycle. But if you have a different candidate uh, who's not been elected, you can have a look at your ballot that, um, that you submitted and to see if you could change it so that in the next round, you'll come back into the committee. So in this case, candidate three um, has a voting weight of, of five million and he's realized that he voted for candidates one, two and three. So to put himself in the committee, assuming everyone else votes the same in the next round, he can simply just deselect candidate two. And now candidate two has been removed from the committee and candidate three has put himself in. And that's a very simple uh, computational algorithm to run. And you can be more tricky if, if you want to, try and hide this behavior, you, you can uh, vote for other people which you, you don't think uh, will be your rivals for the next election cycle. So in this, this case, candidate three has tried to be a bit more tricky and vote for candidate four. Uh, so hope that no one else can say to him that you've been um, manipulating your ballot. So that, that concludes the strategic voting example. I, I hope that's fairly simple to understand. Um, uh, what I clarified with the second step is that strategic voting is, is not as, as simple as just looking for block producer candidates who have not voted for many people. They might, the, they might be strategically voting, but also still voting for a lot of people. So it's not as simple as the number of other candidates they've voted for. And then this is even without mentioning vote buying. So I, um, I've been informed that vote buying is, is becoming more of a problem in EOS now. Um, and what can we do to stop it? So we definitely have some ideas, but it relates to the second floor of, um, it, relate, it relates a bit to the second floor that we've identified of standard approval voting. So the second floor is about non-representation. Um, so a very simple way to think about this is if I have 51% of the coins, I would be able to elect the entire committee. Um, and that doesn't quite sound that fair because you would hope that uh, the other 49% of the electorate would be represented by 49% 40, of the selected committee. So how can we formalize this um, intuitive concept? So this is what this example is about now. In this example, um, we have a committee that needs to be selected of size three. And we have quite 
uh, we have we have twelve different ballots. So um, assume it's just twelve different individuals, um, eight of which are voting on the left side. Uh, they're voting for John, Jane, and Mary, and four of which are voting on the right side for Joe and Fred. So uh, under standard approval voting, um, we just get the tally of each um, candidate and we'd put the ones with the most votes into the elected committee. So it's very simple. It's just uh, the candidates that the left side voted for. So John, Jane and Mary. So now we can analyze the the represent um we can analyze how many representatives of the selected committee each voter has uh, and we can see that 66 well we can see that two-thirds of the uh, electorate have three representatives and one third have zero hmm right let's let's see where we're going with this um in the theory, in the background, um, we have an axiom that that says um, each each n divided by <laughs> right each n divided by k portion of the electorate should have at least one representative. So here we've got twelve voters, and we've got k equals three. So k is the number of uh, select selected committee members and n divided by k equals four so and i think it makes sense so if you have three slots you would if you want to make it completely fair you'd say one third of the electorate uh, would be represented by one slot and uh, one you know another third by another slot another third by another so the idea is um let me just step because it gets a bit more complicated. Yeah, if no, we have, am I allowed to interrupt you? <laughs> sure. Yes. 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 Please. No, are you ha I mean, if you're happy with questions and notes once in a while, um, yes. Uh, on EOS, of, of course, uh, one token is not one vote as such. The vote is also based on the staked amount, obviously. So if if I were to vote, uh, you you have it on the slide as eight um, votes. Uh, you assume eight of equal votes, right? So you have 12 equal voters on your example. Yeah, to, to make it a bit more simplified, that we're assuming just equal votes here. Yes. Um, but our our initial formalism um, was assuming equal votes for everyone, but we've modified the formalism since then to um, so that different people have different number of coins effectively, mm. right? Yes. Um, so yeah, the, the idea here is is if we have um, an n divided by k section of the electorate which is consistent, they should have a representative. So how do we make it? How do we make it a consistent portion of the electorate? And the idea of this axiom called justified representation is um, a group is consistent if everyone vote for the same candidate, at least one same candidate and they all do not have an elected representative. So if we can find a portion of electorate that satisfies those two properties, uh, all voting for at least one candidate, and all do not have an elected representative, then we then the axiom says that this group of people should actually have an elected uh, representative because currently they are being unfairly represented. So. This axiom is, is satisfied in this example. Uh, sorry, sorry, this axiom is not satisfied in this example. So we have to make a change to the elected committee to satisfy the axiom. So, so, the, so the idea here is that we would ch change the elected committee. We would swap uh, someone that the group of eight have voted for. We'd take that out of the elected committee. In this case, we took out Mary. And we put in someone that the group uh, of four have voted for. So in this case, we've randomly selected Fred. And now we've changed the committee so it satisfies the axiom that I just introduced. Everyone, uh, every sorry, every subset of the electorate that's 
n, n divided by k size um who all vote for the same candidate well they all now have an elected representative so that's good um but that's our most basic axiom for representation we also have um a more complicated version which i'm not going to go into the full example because it uh, does get the, the first bit was quite complicated to show but the second bit is even more complicated um instead of instead of n divided by k uh, size sub-electorates, we look at each L times N divided by K sub-electorates uh, and we say they're a consistent electorate if they all vote for the same L candidates um, but they should and they should have at least L elected representatives. Uh, if they do not have L elected representatives then we need to modify the committee again so that it becomes um, rep representative in terms of in terms of this axiom and we look at different sizes of l from one to um to k so in e for eos it'd be from one to 21 and we analyze each uh different size so that, i think that's the most complicated part of the talk I can maybe go through it again later if needed Okay, okay, great. Uh, how do you factor in? Uh, so just a couple of questions from my yep. notes here. Um, uh, I, I don't want you to go into the details, but how would you start uh, allowing for the token weight in, in terms of state? Will it be, will you be increasing, will you consider each token as one vote? Y yes, yeah, that's it. We, we consider each token as one vote. Okay. Uh, and effect effectively, our electorate is not people, it's coins. So that's how we've modified the formalism. Um, so, you, you know, because it is blockchain, our pseudo anonymous environment. So some one person could have more than one account. So it's better just to analyze everything from the coin perspective. OK, uh, so uh, on US, for example, we have about 30 percentage of all the coins voting. So that's about 300 million tokens voting. So yep. in this, in that case, would N be equal to 300 million? Uh, y yes, if that, if that is the number of coins voting, yes. Okay, okay. And, and K, as you said, is 21 block producers we are aiming for, that's fine. And then N divided by K makes sense, okay, that, that's fine. Um, uh, another question. Yep. We have more than 21 in terms of standby BPs. So, um, uh, how would you allow for that? Will N increase to allow for standby BPs, in your opinion, or? Ah, th this this is um, actually a really good point. I hadn't thought about it until now. But so effectively, in EOS, you're uh, electing, shall we say, two committees, one that that definitely does the blocks and the standby committee, right? Yeah, uh, yes, there are actually one committee, it just orders uh, and it kind of cuts off at top 21 and then you have, yeah, standbys. So, so okay, so, so everyone else is standby in that case, is it? Yes, yes, you, you could say that, yes. So there, there could be paid and unpaid standbys. Uh, at the moment, at about 90, 95 VPs, you get some sort of payment daily and after which there is no payment at all. But you could assume everybody is a standby BP. Okay, but it, it sounds like the, the paid standby list is is at least another category. Um, so that's that's a very good point. I think we'll have to try and work that into our formalisms after we finish this section. Yeah. Okay, no, that's great. And just one, one more thing. Um, yep. uh, just if you want to keep it simple, you have yep. 21, how would you rank the 21 uh, in this example? Or is it just a case of you get, this is your top 21, or is this an ordered list at the end of the day? Um, uh, okay, so Ineos, you are, you're paid according to position, is it? Um, yes, at the moment, yes. But on some EOS chains, you're not paid according to position. You get, if you're on the top 21, you get a set pay. So on some EOS IO chains, they do that. Uh, which, I mean, the, the difference on the pay is very minimal in the top 21 anyway, so it doesn't matter much. I was just okay. wondering if there is a way to also rank the top 21 um, under this method. Um, I mean, 
<laughs> yes, there is. I mean, this relates to some of my slides at the end when I'm describing <laughs> the algorithm that that we're implementing. Um, could we move that question to the end? Yes, I think absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yes. Okay. Um, so that that was an example of uh, possible flaws of firstly strategic voting and secondly representation. So then the question is what to do. Uh, and this is about the research that we have been doing recently uh, in the university since uh, January this year. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm starting with a vis visualization here. It, we need to maybe change the, the people's mindset about how we come to a committee. There isn't just one possible committee. Of, the, there is uh, a committee with the block producers who get the most votes, right? But that's only one of many possible committees. Um, then you have a subset of possible committees that satisfy uh, these axioms of representation that I've briefly gone through previously. Um, and then finally, we have a set of committees that we can generate with algorithms that are computationally uh, hard to manipulate. So out of these three sets of possible committees, um, if we want to, well, if we want to satisfy fair representation, of course, we've got to look at a committee in, in the red section. Uh, but if we want to maybe get rid of vote buying, we need we need to make it difficult for someone to understand if if they buy votes from someone else is that going to help them um and if it's if if it's a computationally hard problem um at least it's going to make it more awkward for for people going around vote buying so in my opinion we need to pick a committee which is in the intersection of the green red and orange section um but if we look at the theory, um, the committee that is selected where we pick candidates who have the total, uh, the most total o overall votes, that committee could, it might be in any part. It might be uh, just in the orange section or in the red section or in the green section, but there's no th uh, theoretical guarantee that it will be in any section apart from the orange section, the set of possible committees. Um, so we've been looking at algorithms that will guarantee that we find a committee right in that green section intersecting with the red. Um, that's that's the high level introduction to the, the research. Um, we can start to put more detail onto that and to say exactly why we're doing it, uh, exactly how we're doing it. So we've picked some axioms of fair representation that we briefly discussed previously. Um, this was from work, uh, you, again, with, with leaders in the field in this um, st approval voting category of voting systems. And then there's been um, a recent, only last year, an algorithm that was published about how we can generate committees uh, that satisfy these axioms. Um, that is um, easy. It's it's uh, computationally easy to generate because a, a problem that we did not want to introduce is saying we have all these ideas, but by the way, block producer candidates, you now have to do two hours of computation every night. That that of course is is not going to work. We want like a quick algorithm that can be run, but is also uh, difficult to manipulate. So we've selected our axioms, we've selected our algorithm to generate committees and to check committees for these axioms, um, and we are starting to implement it. And yeah, again, there's another slide of the underpinning academic work for anyone who's interested in this for more detail. Um, the represented, representation axioms were outlined two years ago in a journal paper, and the algorithm for committee generation was last year. And these are, uh, you know, leading conferences and journals in the world. Um, so let, let's go, let's visualize what the algorithm is. That that's, seems to be 
the best way to show it. So we have a graph here um, where there's candidates, block producers, on one side, which is the letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E. And then we have voters that are represent, representative, well, represented by circles. Um, and they all have different uh, stake, and they all have a different number of coins, and they're all um, represented, represented by different number of block producers in the selected committee. And to explain properly, the selected committee are the letters that are in bold. So the selected committee in, the, in this example is B, C, D, E and A has not been selected. And our algorithm underneath the hood, it's linking candidate block producers um, to voters via um, in, in a graph structure. So it's more computationally easy to resolve the next sections. So now we've got a graph, we've got two um, vectors, stake and representative number, and we want to evaluate this committee. So each voter um, gets an individual score that um, takes as input the num the stake that they have and the how many uh, candidate no sorry how many block producers they are represented by in the selected committee. So every single every, yeah every single voter has this individual score, and then we combine we just sum them up to generate a committee score. Um, and this is how we can evaluate a single committee. Okay, great. Uh, look, uh, just a few questions here. So um, the, the first voter on this slide of yours voted for one candidate BP and has zero representation because the block producer that that voter voted for is not in the committee. So then the representation is zero and they only voted for one. Is that correct? Yes, that, that, that's correct in this example. So actually their, their score here uh, would be zero because um, yeah, we don't have any um, representatives. But the way we calculate a score is not a simple sum. Um, it, we calculate it in a specific way which has specific properties. So I can give you an example. So voter two uh, here has uh, voted for... Uh, B, B and C. So, well, she's voted for A, B and C, yes. but, but only B and C are in, in the committee. So she has two representatives. Okay, so she gets a... Before we think about the stake, her score would be uh, one and then, uh, and then plus a half. Uh, <laughs> um, because we with and then we'll times that score, so that'd be one point five. Then we'll times it by eighteen, and a far uh, so the total score would be nine. So uh, it might sound weird the way we do it like that, but there's there is specific properties um, about this calculation score me mechanism that's in the literature, um, which makes uh, I'm trying to remember the reason why. But I might have to come back to you and no, follow up. That, that. That's perfectly fine. That's a, so, so I'm totally with you on this slide. I'm sure the viewers are too. So good. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, but yeah, it's it's not a simple scoring mechanism. Is is my point? Hmm. Um, okay, so then then we, we can move between committees. So and we can see if we are improving uh, one committee by swapping a candidate out and putting a new candidate in. Uh, so in this um, example, we have effectively two elected committees side by side. Uh, the first on the left, we have B, C, D and E. Uh, uh, on the right, we have A, B, C and D. So we've swapped out E and we've put in A. Um, so we would recalculate the committee score. And if the the committee score of for the committee on the right hand side is greater than the committee on the left hand side, then we have um, a better committee. And we keep doing that process until we can't continue. Um, we, we have had to modify s some of the underlying formalism uh, to make this process a lot more um, 
efficient because previously every time we were recalculating a committee score we'd have to run through the entire electorate and calculate each voter's new individual score but we don't have to do that really we can just recalculate a subsection of the electorate as individual committee score and then sum it up so yes yeah, so, so we move between committees until we can't improve the committee score anymore so that's that's the ideas uh, and the overview so what progress have we been making at king's college um we we're looking at three different progress areas to progress so from a theory perspective we've had to adapt the literature for the weighting voting environment so that uh we're thinking now in in terms of coins for each peop, uh, for each voter, and not just vote. Every voter has equal weight. Um, yeah, we've also adapted this search algorithm um, when we change between committees. Uh, we made we've adapted it for speed reasons, and then we've started our implementation process. Um, but yeah, we have a current we have a small current bug bug at the moment um, in the adaptions that we've 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 done for speed reasons uh i think it's just a rounding error but you, you know what it's like to go search through and try and work out or i've put, I've put a one instead of where, where a zero should be <laughs> so i'll work on that very soon and of course we've, we've done a lot of engagement with you guys um and you've been very helpful with your voting data as well has really helped um evaluate our current implementations of the algorithm so we can improve it that's really yes. been really valuable. I'm very happy to help. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a, just a, an overview of how it works from a, st a step process. I've sort of described it. We start with a committee. We dis we currently, f well, we originally thought we should start with the committee um, that has the largest number of votes. Like, um, so the committee that would be selected by the standard approval voting system and then we take that and we s try and swap out the um block producer can the block selected block producers who have the less the, the least number of votes we try and swap them out with other people uh, to generate a new co a new committee that has a better total score and we keep doing that until th there's no more um, improvements can be made with any swaps from anyone, uh, from any candidate. But we're, we're rethinking this a little bit um, because if we start with the committee with the largest number of votes, it it might still be easy to manipulate because there's always a single starting point. So we might have to try and randomize the committee that we start with. Um, so that's that's a work in progress that we're thinking about, and I think this related to your pre your question that we parked for a bit. Can you remind me of that question, R Rowan? Yes, I was on. Oh, okay. My microphone was muted. We had a question about uh, how the top twenty one was ranked. Is that is that what we? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, how do you rank them um, in the committee? Uh, yes, so we were we were ranking them inside the selected committee still by the number of total votes that um, they they had, uh, this, the number of total coin votes. Okay, okay uh, perfect. So, but then yes, this is why we're, we're reevaluating it because we're thinking if if we rank them like that from the beginning, we might we might open the algorithm up to to be. Uh, still still fairly easy to manipulate but not as easy to manipulate as it is currently but what we want is to we want the theory people of our group to say that here's an algorithm that is computationally hard to understand if you can change your vote for um uh, to improve your position so that that's the property we're searching for and we're hopeful for mm -hmm. Uh, oh, great. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and then the, just the overall summary slide. So, yeah, our next steps is to complete the algorithm um, uh, by firstly finding the bug and secondly uh, working out what point to start at. Uh, and now we've got another point that you've you've raised about should we think about the standby block producers as well. 
uh, and then and then fi finally we have another stream is to evaluate um, the current elected committees and see if actually if we were using our algorithm we could actually improve on the currently selected committees as they happen in real time. Yes. Okay. Well, wonderful. And uh, oh, you, you've you've been sending us your updated algorithms, and we've been looking at modeling them. So as soon as you complete your algorithm, you know we'll be happy to model it and see how it would look and things like that. Um, just a question quickly: um, What if two committees have the same representation uh, and both are at the highest? How do you say which one's preferable? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, it, it, it's probably going to be possible. Just thinking. Yeah, it, it it is possible in theory, uh, but if if you're following, so we're going to provide an algorithm that does this step, well these steps, and if you follow it specifically, um, you'll go to one specific committee of that group. Um, so it, it will be dependent on rules such as which um, block producer committee, uh, sorry, which block producer do we swap out? It, it's possible that if you swap out uh, number 21 instead of number 20 or vice versa, you might end up to a different committee. So we, we need to be very clear on the reason uh, why you would choose which uh, block producer to swap out. That's why we were thinking we would still do it in terms of the number of votes that they have. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's a difficult point. I agree. I agree. OK, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's so nice. that, that's that's all I have for you guys today. Okay. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, uh, when do we expect to see the when can we expect to see the algorithm, do you think, based on the progress you've made so far? Uh, the, okay, um, I I need to find this bug first, but I, I probably I'll have next week on it, um, and I'll put maybe I'll put some GitHub st some stuff on GitHub after next week, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Luke. Thank you for. Um, this is a big part of what the US community is thinking about over the last couple of months and so on. So it's very timely. And I hope we are able to like uh, take all these uh, um, work that you've been doing in the academic field as well, and then uh, hopefully bring some of it into EOS. And really, so that's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Luke. Hopefully, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Perfect. Bye. Bye. Yeah. So yes.